Welcome back to the Tech Talks Daily Podcast. And today, i got another treat in store for you, especially if you're a data enthusiast. Because joining me today is Taggart Matheson, the Chief Product Officer at Logic Monitor. And he's an absolute dynamo in the SaaS product world, with an impressive resume that spans leadership roles across Lyft, where he spearheaded autonomous driving initiatives to crafting Twitter's data product group and even shaping developer and analytics platforms at Salesforce. But I want to learn more about his deep and wide-ranging expertise, his origin story, the path that led him to Logic Monitor, and much more. So today we're going to be diving deep into the heart of data observability and discuss why it's the cornerstone of modern business success and also hopefully unravel the complex layers of AI and data responsibility. So if you are a data enthusiast, and I think if you're in business, everybody is now, you should love this one. So buckle up and hold on tight as I beam your ears all the way to California, where Taggart is waiting to share his story. So a massive warm welcome to the show, Taggart. Can you tell everyone listening a little about who you are and what you do? Absolutely. First of all, thanks for having me on the show here. Excited to be here. I'm the chief product officer at Logic Monitor for all things product and design. And I guess maybe a quick summary on Logic Monitor. It's a SaaS-based observability and intelligence platform, which provides unified observability across infrastructure, networks, cloud, containers, applications, and it empowers companies to focus less on troubleshooting and more on innovation. And I guess I've been here for just over seven months as the CPO, but been a blast so far. And I guess prior to Logic Monitor, I've been in the product space for 20 years, worked at Salesforce for about nine from 2004 to 2013, building out the Salesforce platform and analytics engine, kind of really cut my chops here. And then hopped over to Twitter for about two years. Pretty interesting experience again in product and owned the streaming and REST APIs and help start kind of their data platform. And then I guess last but not least, spent about seven years at Lyft, pretty much touched all of the product areas, had a chance to build out Lyft's self-driving group, and did this for four years with a quick stint in observability at Lyft right before joining Logic Monitor. And about me, I don't know, I live in Marin, I have a mountain biker, father of two crazy boys, and I have a very well-fed lab. Wow, there's so much to unpack there. So before we talk about Logic Monitor, I always like to find out more about people's origin story and lessons they've learned along the way. So, I mean, with your vast SaaS product experience, including at Lyft, Twitter, and Salesforce, uh, can you share with me some of the significant lessons that maybe you learned, particularly in leveraging your enterprise and technical consumer experience to to challenge established enterprise players? Because You've been, you must have had a few experiences and a few stories in the about during this time. Uh, yeah, they did too many stories. I mean, I think the first I would start is customer empathy. And it, this kind of takes me way back to Salesforce. I was on the technical implementation side, so consulting side. I was the guy that had to implement what we sold. And I was building out these custom integrations. And I kept complaining kind of to the product team, explaining their API just wasn't sufficient for what I was trying to do. And they just didn't take the time to look at my problem, or frankly, kind of use cases in terms of how I was leveraging it. And it was really annoying because they just didn't, they didn't take the time to think about how people would use that product. And ultimately, I got tired, or at least they got tired of me complaining, and I joined product or their product team and helped Salesforce build out that platform for the next eight years. I think the point here is that there's a real difference between sympathy and empathy. I've seen a number of product managers sympathize with end users, trying to connect, trying to understand the problems, but it's not really until you're in the, you know, the prov- proverbial shoes of the individual that you truly understand you know, who and what you're building for. So, so that's the empathy side. I think, I mean, I guess jumping to Twitter, I'd probably say two things. One, data, I, I was amazed how uh, predictive data can be. So Twitter has or had a massive data amount or a significant amount of data. And of course, you need to use this responsibly. But regardless, this was pretty, pretty powerful. And there's this great story that I remember where a very large fast food chain in the U.S. was monitoring their brand, and they found a bunch of interesting negative tweets complaining about soggy fries. And these tweets, well, they had lat long coordinates attached to them. So you could, we basically took these and localized and then triangulated them to a few chains in Illinois. And they went to these stores and realized fry temps were too low. So it was kind of wild to see 
the insights that you could glean. I'd never think like soggy fries to low temperatures to a handful of stores. I think maybe the not so positive on Twitter was the concept of like analysis paralysis. So we were all so afraid to ship. And I think that was one of the biggest challenges and pains of Twitter. Just really didn't see a ton of innovation with the app. And teams just weren't empowered to truly experiment with the UX. And the application basically just became stale. So it was kind of a bummer. And then I think list a couple of things. What And this really goes into kind of the consumer world. You know, experimentation, really hard to do in the enterprise. You don't have the luxury of experimenting on your ad users like you do with consumer. And in the consumer world, it's amazing because you can iterate, you can work with different treatments, and you can frankly identify what works best. And we did this all over the place from onboarding to pickups, drop-offs. It was pretty powerful and something that I think is unique to the consumer space. And then the last, I know I kind of started with this, but I'm probably going to come back, yeah. is know the problem space. So for example, imagine designing, this is at list, imagine designing an airport, airport pickup experience from an office. Like you just can't imagine the complexity. You can't feel challenges that exist from getting off the plane, to looking for your baggage, to then looking for the signage, figuring out where your car is, what level in the garage, it becomes a real challenge. And so I think a lot with product and where I kind of push people is you really need to experience it firsthand. And it seems so easy designing it, but then in the real, entirely different level of complexity. Love it. Absolutely brilliant. What a backstory. And fast forward to 2023, I was doing a little research on you and I was reading how you've suggested that data is currently the hobby of every business. But can you elaborate on this concept and the growth potential that you see in this data observability space? Yeah. So I think there's two angles. There's the business side, and this kind of comes back to when I worked at Lyft. If our matching service went down, our entire business went down. If people can't take rides or drivers can't service rides, it was down. And it wasn't just that we were losing rides in business. It was also the switching costs as well of people moving to other services like Uber. It was painful. But what was powerful was the fact that we could link a simple outage to lost revenue. And this was a really powerful mechanic that we kind of tracked our business by. And, and at Logic Monitor, we're actually seeing a lot of companies start to tie their infrastructure and resilience of their infrastructure to business value and outcomes. The tracking data, especially heartbeat data is key, but then tying it back to your business, especially your customers' experiences, I think this is critical. And we're going to see continued innovation and focus here. And then I think on the data side, there's so much more than just watching system health metrics. Kind of like, as I described with Twitter, there's a wealth of information or in the monitoring space. And the Logic Monitors platform has some really interesting tools. We have these agentless collectors that basically act as monitors in the customer's environments and they actively monitor, but they also learn the topology and the relationships within the network, which is really powerful when you think about troubleshooting. And it's this, con this contextual metadata which is the key. So I think the metadata inclusion, this is another big thing or a big focus area in terms of advancements. And I suspect that every business leader listening has encountered that garbage in and garbage out problem, which also brings me to another point that I've seen you make, and that is that 99% of enterprise data is either noisy or essentially useless. And I'm curious, on this side of things, at a moment in time where data and having clean data for AI and machine learning algorithms is so important, what strategies or tools do you offer at Logic Monitor to employ to identify and present that useful 1% for enabling business changing decision driving observability? Because I think most businesses know that's where they need to get to, but getting there is a different matter, isn't it? Right. And and maybe I was a little hyperbolic with that statement. I mean, I've seen it a couple of times. And the story is like this. But the organization realizes they don't have enough data. So all of a sudden, everyone's jumping up and down. And this happened to me at Twitter. This happened to me at Lyft. We need more data. We need more data. Let's instrument it. And then all of a sudden, your development team start instrumenting all kinds of stuff like custom events, logs, metrics. And even if you don't have a consistent framework and process, it gets messy fast. So you have to track this stuff. And then more importantly, you need to persist it. You need to make it searchable. You need to support dashboards and alerts. And, and again, like I said earlier, it gets really noisy. And frankly, it gets expensive too. So at Logic Monitor, we built a number of features for our customers to specify the type of data that they want to monitor and frequency. And it's kind of like right out of the box. Uh, we also have a number of dashboards and tools that help set the right balance at the start. So help give customers 
or companies' frameworks. And we've also released additional tools like dynamic thresholds where we can help fight some of the noise that you get and also find the right balance for things like alerting. And even some of the new tools that we have that sift through the data to find correlation and effectively group data into much more digestible forms, that's really powerful. And it's not just about helping with correlation. It's also about finding and pinpointing anomalies. So we have some great tools for anomaly detection, which again helps with customers sift through this massive amount of data and focus on what really matters. And then I think last, I talked about this a little bit earlier, but we also have some great tools for general cost optimization. So again, as people invest more heavily in observability tools, it can get expensive. So providing visibility into the cost structures of the observability deployments, this is something that we've been working on. And we're building out products focused on identifying optimizations and recommendations here. I'm curious, how do you approach the challenge of separating valuable data from all the noise and present it in a more meaningful and actionable way? And just to bring that to life, do you have an example of a time where Logic Monitors has helped a client do this? Yeah, and it's interesting. We talk about this a lot on separating kind of the valuable data from the noise. And I have actually have a great story about this that just kind of serendipitous. It happened yeah. I was about two weeks ago. We were talking to a customer who was piloting Dexta. Now, Dexta is our new kind of AI ops tool that helps with alert storms. Basically, creates correlations on the fly and groups alerts into insights. So imagine like thousands of alerts. How are you going to handle that? Well, it groups them into a set of insights and makes them extremely manageable. Anyways, in any case, we were following up with the pilot with the customer and we were discussing this complete network outage that they had for eight hours, completely stopping business. And we were talking about what happened and how they diagnosed it. And then someone on my team asked, hey, I wonder if Dexta identified it. Now, mind you, we're still in the pilot, so it wasn't fully in production. So we flipped to his screen or we flipped to his laptop and he showed that Dexta had grouped all of these alerts into a few key insights, all high highlighting a routing protocol chain. And boom, that, that was it. Someone had changed a routing procedure with one of their firewalls and it cascaded into a complete network crash. And so it was really cool to see one of our features providing immediate value out, out of the box. Fantastic. What a great story. Isn't it? And also, we've mentioned AI and machine learning. Of course, it's 2023. That's all anyone's talking about. Is there anything you can explain or expand on around the importance of data responsibility in the context of AR and why we might not be ready to use AI to contextualize data fully yet? Yeah, I think, it's, I think this is pretty huge. People tend to think AI is going to solve everything. And what they don't realize is while it's a huge leap, it's not always correct. So you get a ton of false positives or false negatives, or frankly, in terms of recall, it just this events. And so you need to tune these models and you need to refine these models to better understand your environment and the needs. And as you do this, you can improve the precision of your models. For example, you know, I was just talking about Dexta, you know, while we have models out of the box and the system does learn. It effectively self-tunes. We also have tools for customers to kind of tune these models to help improve the quality of the correlations and the insights. So I guess I guess my point is AI is great as a guide or a helper providing insightful context, but it takes time and cycles uh, to trust it and train it. I'm curious, if we bring it back to the logic monitor again, how are you guys ensuring responsible handling of data, particularly in relation to AI? Because using this technology responsibly and ethically is another big topic right now. So is there anything you can share about that and the kind of safeguards that are in place to prevent maybe misuse or misinter misinterpretation of, of data? Yeah, our, and this is great. It's a really interesting area. And our customers trust us with their data. And this is a huge honor and responsibility and one we take seriously. With this, we have a number of safeguards in place to ensure appropriate security measures. And when it comes to AI, you know, all of the algorithms are siloed to individual customer data. So I think we've done a lot with security perspectives to make sure that data doesn't move out of those environments. But you didn't mention you didn't mention Gen AI, which I feel like is yeah. one of those big topics when it comes to data responsibility. First off, I mean, I think there's a ton of promise with this advancement. And generative AI for text and image is pretty amazing. And we see a ton of application even for our platform, from like an admin co-pilot to to real-time troubleshooting. But with this being said, we fundamentally believe that the security of our customers' data is our first focus. And yes, we want to leverage customer data with these generative tools. 
Um, but we need to do it responsibly. We need to do it in a way that doesn't leak data to public models. You know, and yes, there's ways to get there. There's some betting and private models. But we're going to take a measured and trusted approach, very similar that we've done with all other types of customer data you know, in, in this space. Exciting times ahead. It sounds like we'll have to get you on next year, find out more about that. But as we, we do look awesome. towards the future, how do you see the field of data observability evolving? And is anything you can share around what Logic Monitor's plans are for the future and the months ahead to, to keep driving innovation in this space? I appreciate you probably locked down and can't share too much, but is there anything you can? Yeah, for sure. I won't share too much, but I think I will share some good points here. The so first is lowering observability cost until consolidation. And you know, at Logic Monitor, we're uniquely positioned where we can do both. We can help be that single tool for observability. And then two, we have a number of tools that help companies understand and better rationalize their spend. And we're investing heavily here. Some exciting things on the roadmap for sure that are going to tie back to cost optimizations and recommendations. So I guess the first one is cost. The second is context. So for a long time, observability has been about detecting what's gone wrong. But I definitely see the space evolving where the systems don't just detect. They start to bring context into the problem. So instead of just waking up and seeing an alert, you know, that system just went down, the observability tool would also provide additional context. What else happened in the environment or, like, or location? And either, you know, related in terms of topology, like simple, similar patterns or just general anomalies in the same time range. Or maybe it's just a pattern in the system that has been seen before. And it's starting to correlate based on these previous patterns. So I really about adding more context and detail into this space. I think that's pretty critical. And then third, and we'll talk about this a little bit, but third is intelligence system. And I'm not talking self-healing networks yet, but as more context is fed into these systems and the feedback loops are strengthened, there's a real opportunity to move from identifying to predicting. And the challenge with these predictions, as I mentioned earlier, is the underlying precision. So improving the tooling here, increasing precision and recall, that's key. And this is going to take time. But even here, before the high quality predictions, there's a ton of opportunity for improvement, like dynamic runbooks as part of this process. For example, as events or outages happen, rather than having to search for an associated runbook, what if the system identified the right one? What if it already ran or pre-ran the troubleshooting queries or made sure that they were already cached or the dashboards were already refreshed and the support and log metrics were already extracted and presented? Basically simplifying the work required to remediate and resolve. And giving this intelligence to an SRE or an individual troubleshooting is pretty powerful. And if you can capture enough signal with this runbook and this process, then you could turn this into an automated step and potentially, yes, maybe self-healing. So pretty excited here. Fantastic. A great moment to end the podcast on today. But we did start the conversation talking about your origin story that took you from Lyft, Twitter, and Salesforce to the great work you're doing at Logic Monitor and now, and also your future vision at Logic Monitor too. But of course, now we've come full circle. I'm going to ask you to look back throughout your career. Is there a funny or interesting story that happened in your career that you are able to share with everyone listening? Is there any stories there you can share? Yeah. So I was the product lead for Lyft self-driving group for three or four years. And I was asked to do an interview and I was really excited. So excited that I didn't actually... I didn't actually read the brief. So I just kind of dived in. It was for New York Magazine. And in any case, this reporter started asking all these questions about my tech likes. So I talked about my iPhone, my Sono speakers, my espresso machine, I don't know, whatever. It was, I was excited about coffee at the time. And then the interview was done. And I was really confused because they didn't ask a single question about self driving. And when it was posted, it was a pretty embarrassing read of my tech interests. That's what it was about. It was, basically about what are your interests in the field. And quite a few of my colleagues found it hilarious and started printing and posting the interview all over the office. Uh, So the moral of the story is to read the briefs, I guess, and don't claim the iPhone is the greatest thing since sliced bread because that's hurt me so far. Oh, man, those Android techies are not going to be happy with you when you put something like that out there. I'm going to try and look that up after I leave you today. But before, before I do, For anyone listening, wanting to find out more information about anything we talked about, the work you're doing at Logic Monitor, how they can keep up to speed with things and contact your team, et cetera, where would you like to point everyone? Yeah, absolutely. We have a website, logicmonitor.com, where you can learn even more.
Awesome. Well, I get that added to the show notes so people can find you and your team nice and easily. But love chatting with you today. I think we covered a lot from your origin story to why data is now the heartbeat of every business and indeed the growth potential in the data observability space, not to mention the importance of data responsibility around AI and why many are not quite ready to use AI to contextualize data. And we even had time for a funny story to end on. But more than anything, just thank you for sharing your story and everything else with me today. Thanks again. All right, thanks, Neil. What an incredibly cool guy. Huge thank you to Taggart for joining me on the podcast today and where we did explore the intricacies of data observability, some of the challenges and the gold nuggets hidden in the 1% of useful enterprise data. And I think we dived into the ever-evolving realm. And of course, we had to dive into the ever-evolving realm of AI and why responsible use of data is not just a buzzword. It should be an imperative in this digital age. And I was particularly struck by how Dexter, Logic Monitor's AI ops tool, has been a game changer in real world scenarios. But as always, this isn't where the conversation ends. For those of you that want to learn more about Logic Monitor and Taggart's work, please check out their website, find out more information there. If you've got any questions you would like to share, if you've got some stories, some experiences that you want to share around this, please do that too simply by emailing me techblogwriteroutlook.com social channels at neil c hughes nice and easy to find so i encourage you to do that say hello but we've reached the end of this episode so stay curious and hopefully join me again tomorrow where we'll do it all again but thanks for listening and until next time don't be a stranger Mm -hmm.